everybody. Uh, good evening. I'm Lee DeBoer, and on behalf of my colleagues on the forum board and our president, Pat Jenny, if you're in this evening, I'd like to welcome everybody to what I'm sure will be an interesting discussion of the challenges facing our country's security. Before introducing our speakers, I'd just like to mention we will be hosting two more events this spring. Richard Haas, past president of the Council of Foreign Relations, will join us on April 5th at the Hotchkiss School to talk about uh, his recent book, The Hill of Obligations, which he envisions what it means to be an American citizen. On May 10th at Salisbury School, Joshua Goldstein of American University and the University of Massachusetts will discuss the book he co-authored entitled A Bright Future, which examines the subject of nuclear energy as a key part of the solution to the climate crisis. The forum is also going to be offering an opportunity related to that for event. And we're going to do an Oliver Stone movie that's going to be on, available to people who register for that uh, forum on May 10th. Um, speaking of books, our good friends at Oblong will be in the lobby after tonight's talk with copies available for signing and purchase. Uh, and they'll also be at both of the remaining uh, forums this spring. Uh, please note that there's information in your program about how you can donate to the forum. All our programs are open to the public, free of charge, and that's thanks to your support. This evening, we're joined by three distinguished guests who will address key concerns about our nation's security capabilities and discuss ways in which they can be expanded and improved. Tom Shanker is the director of the Project for Media and National Security at Georgetown, and previously Pentagon correspondent for the New York Times, as well as their deputy Washington editor, Washington editor for military and foreign policy. Andrew Hohen is the senior VP for research and analysis at the Rand Corporation, after having served as deputy assistant secretary of defense. They will discuss their new book, the Age of Danger, with Alex Ward, who was recently retired longtime editor at the New York Times and the former director of the Times' book publishing operations. Alex is a neighbor of ours in Salisbury and a longtime friend of the forum. And now I'd like to ask you to give them a nice, warm welcome. To you. I have one correction to make. I've been retired for four years, so not recently retired. But anyway, thank you for that introduction. And I'm very happy to be here with two very smart guys who are going to try to tell us how to stop the end of the world. I mean, this is a very serious book. Uh, it's actually a riveting read because once you start, you can't really put it down. You just want to find out what what could be worse than what you just read. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, obviously Tom and Andy are two people who are very well positioned to write about this uh, subject. So I thought I'd start off by simply asking them how the book came apart, how, how did their partnership uh, start, and how did they come up with the idea of the book, and how did they split up the writing and research? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Thank you. And we thank, thank you for the terrific introduction and to be part of the forum and to all of you for sharing your Friday evening with us. This room is eating your noise. You really need to <laughs> speak. Put, either put the mic closer or pretend you're not in a conversation. And you or move your chairs a little bit closer. Oh, you move your chairs a little bit closer. All of you. Uh, let's, let's how are we doing now? Could you hear me? No? Okay. Dealing with deaf people. I'm not far behind you. Let me know. We will all speak louder, and I'm also in the bad spot after the second period of lunch. Okay, I'm going to start. You know, this partnership between Tom and me is an interesting one. Tom is a New York Times reporter. I was a long-time Pentagon insider. That's where we met. Tom was reporting on national security issues after 9-11. I was working for Secretary of Defense Tom Rumsfeld. I was his head of strategy. There is an interesting relationship between uh, the staff advisors to a cabinet member and the reporters that are part of the process. 
Uh, I, I got, got to know Tom both because of his terrific work as a reporter. He was uh, among the very best in his field. But there's another reason I got to know and work with Tom, and that's because he was trustworthy. Uh, you can speak to Tom, you can speak frankly to Tom about hard, difficult issues we're working on, and he would report fairly well. This wasn't about gotchas. Uh, his work was not about trying to get the latest headline. It was trying to do fair and accurate reporting about what's happening in the world. That's when we got to know each other in the early 2000s. I went to RAND uh, several years later. RAND Corporation provides analysis to the Defense Department uh, on national security questions. We provide analysis on a whole range of larger policy issues. But we stayed in touch over this time. We were friends. We would have lunches on a regular basis uh, at a little restaurant near the Pentagon where uh, we would meet often. And it was really Tom's idea. We were at a lunch one day and he said, this world feels different. Things are changing. And it doesn't feel like we're ready. We were right. And that's really what got us launched on this effort at writing the book. So in the book, by a very interesting dynamic, uh, there's always this very tense relationship between senior national security officials and the media. And that relationship, it's like a marriage, but it's a dysfunctional marriage. Yet we're staying together with the kids. Right? And the kids are our Andy, who was one of the Pentagon's great thinkers, thought it was important to help reporters explain what the Pentagon is doing. Because there's no decision more grand than your elected officials make than going to the war. And you have the right to know about it. And that's what I do. And Andy helped us understand that. Clearly, this book for the right relationship, he was the brains of the operation. Uh, the Pentagon not true. Pentagon yeah. strategies. And we became, I think, not friends, but there was a real warning of our relationship. Andy had written, or ghost written, a very important strategy document for the Pentagon. And the Defense Secretary at the time was, was briefing on it, Donald Rumsfeld. And Donald Rumsfeld, very controversial. And I always have to tell people, just because Donald Rumsfeld said something doesn't automatically make it wrong. I leaned across the well and I said, this would be a really good time to ask for a raise. <laughs> and I, That happens to be a very true statement. And just very, very quickly, you know, writing a book is also like a marriage. I can say, Andy and I worked very intensely for five years on this book. We only argued about one thing. Andy and his wife, Robin, like canoes. My wife, Lisa, and I like kayaks. Other than that, total agreement about everything. That's probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's launch into this book, um, which is which covers a myriad of subjects and the threat they uh, pose to our country's safety. Um, probably the two, well, the two biggest ones and most important ones deal with Russia and China. So we may as well start there and. Uh, Tom, you're really the Russia guy. He, he spent time covering Russia for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he knows it well. And one of the things I, I find kind of interesting about uh, the connection we have is that I first met him when I was doing the book publishing department at the New York Times. And Tom and a, a fellow reporter named Eric Schmidt were doing a book on Al Qaeda. He did well, he was very smart, as everything Tom does is. Um, but uh, in discussing Russia, uh, I think Al Qaeda plays a role that uh, uh, indicates that maybe we put too much attention on Al Qaeda and not enough uh, uh, on Russia. Uh, it was the it was the era of Brezhnev, and I think we figured. Okay, our troubles with Russia are over. Uh, they're going to become maybe not a democracy, but a player in the, in the world stage, and quite possibly an ally of ours. And uh, we didn't notice that uh, there was a guy named Vladimir Putin, who uh, you know had been the KGB guy in Berlin for years, and uh, he didn't think the way Brezhnev did. 
So why don't you talk about that on Russia? Sure, and thanks. Okay. And again, thanks to Lee for having us here and for all of you coming out on Friday. And really, thanks to Alex for editing and pressing Eric Schmidt to write our first book, which was about terrorism. Uh, it was a New York Times bestseller. And as, as my wife says, thank goodness you finally have a lead for your obituary. <laughs> <laughs> So, Andy and I call Russia the threat hiding in plain sight. Um, I spent five years based in Moscow. Again, my time recall, my wife recalls this five winters, her perspective. And, you know, Russia had become a country after the collapse of communism that the West kind of ignored. We thought it was a revolt with rockets or a gas station with rockets. And one of the things that Andy and I really, the epiphany for me in our book and our time together was that how you define a national security threat is the most important thing. Because how you define it defines your answers and your options or limits them. And after 9-11, as Alex said, terrorism became, remember, an existential threat. Existential. What does that mean? Could end our existence. Friends, Al Qaeda could never have ended our existence. They were a threat. 3,000 people died on 9 11. That was a tragedy. But think about COVID. A million people died, and we never went on a national mobilization, let alone a war footing. Whereas after 9 11, we launched two wars. So in the, fo the Zoom light focus on terrorism, for 20 years after 9 11, we ignored this guy named Vladimir Putin, who was in his corner getting angrier and angrier. Because Putin sees himself not as a Communist Party general secretary who wants to take over the world. He sees himself as a new czar who just wants to own his neighborhood. And we ignored him, which just fed this Russian insecurity. And I was the Times' as Pentagon correspondent in 2007 when the new secretary, Bob Gates, went to the Munich Security Conference. And there, Gates was supposed to be the hero, and he was, but Putin delivered a speech which you probably read a lot about since he invaded Ukraine. Because in 2007, in Munich, Putin said exactly what he's been doing for all the years since. And I know that whenever you go to a Nazi analogy, you lose the debate, but that speech was Putin's Mein Kampf. He said he had designs on Georgia, designs on Ukraine. He was going to end America's era as a, as a unipolar power. And all the senators in the front row, all the congressmen, all the smart people said, oh, that's just Putin playing for a whole audience. A year later, he invaded Georgia. And we talk about the Ukraine invasion of two years ago. That was his second invasion. He invaded in 2014. So Putin told us what he was going to do, but we had defined Putin out of the problem set while we were looking at terrorism. Just a quick personal story. Alex talked about how our book is populated by real people. Andy and I had a great interview with General Breedlove, who was NATO's supreme allied commander during the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014. He was home. We had a great Zoom call. Halfway through, he said, guys, my wife's out. Soup's boiling over. Give me a second. It's wonderful to see a four-star general go turn the soup down. Right? <laughs> and he said to us that that invasion caught the West completely flat-footed. Incredible. Putin invaded a democratic, independent country, and the supreme commander of NATO had no warning. He flew back to Washington, where he said he went off like a well hit nine iron in a tile bathroom. He was so angry. What he was told was that all of the intelligence apparatus, all of the machine that Andy will talk about, designed to watch for threats, had been turned away from Russia and onto terrorism. We blinded ourselves, and now we have Vladimir Putin. Do I talk about consuming part? Yeah, I think that's a great. Uh, segue to how we think about these topics. Tom and I address a whole range of topics in this book in our description of the danger. 
as in saying the national security problem that we see today is different than the one that we would have seen in the 1980s. Definitely different than the one we saw in 2001 in which we tuned our national security apparatus on this problem of terrorism. And certainly, you know, so different than what, you know, to what we're looking at today as we see problems arising of different sorts and we're going to get into that in the discussion. We, we try to describe the apparatus that deals with these problems in two ways. We call it the warning machine and the action machine. The warning machine is all those pieces of information that come to the leadership that alert us to problems. Not as in big sweeping matters, but in fine detail of problems. That knowing that, that there is an issue arising, knowing that it represents a challenge to the United States, we count on the warning machine to be quite specific about how that operates. I think one way to think about that is a tale of two crises. Uh, Tom talked about uh, Putin's of invasion of Ukraine. The second time around, in 2022, that happened in a way that was on display for the world. You'll recall CIA director Burns um, in the newspapers, it was being covered, flying to both NATO and then to Moscow, putting photographs in front of the Russian leadership to say, we see your military formations sitting outside of Ukraine. We know you are about to invade. That is a warning machine that is allowing decision makers to speak to the world, to speak to other parties, and, and being able to connect that to real decisions about action. Warning, warning, by the way, comes in lots of different pieces. You'll think about the intelligence community, to be sure. This is the CIA, the Director of National Intelligence, all of the satellite uh, apparatus that's run by the, by the Defense Department, the communications that have, comes to the National Security Agency. All that is part of warning. But so is the communications that's coming from friends and allies that come through business relationships. Uh, it's all of these pieces that comprise a warning machine. But warning is only <coughs> effective if there's an action apparatus that's tied to it. Decision makers can be warned of a problem, but if there's nothing they can do with it, then they're just left with a problem. So warning and action are connected. And we talk about the action machine as well. I'll use Ukraine as another is a good example. It wasn't just the warning that Russia was about to invade. But it was turning on the machinery to be able to support Ukraine in its defense of its own territory. It was using NATO as a vehicle in which weapons and armaments and food, uh, water, uh, fuel, all the supplies that Ukraine depends on to fight this war, many of them coming from themselves, but a lot of it coming from allies. That's through an action machine that's been developed over years and years and years. So take that as one sort of model of warning and action what happened in Ukraine in 2022. Now to think about COVID. Uh, one of the great and very interesting, and I have to say most disturbing aspects of the research Tom and I did on this book was sitting down and talking to people from the intelligence community, from the public health community. Uh, very different uh, walks of life and expertise. And we would invariably end a discussion by asking the question, so what worries you most? This is 2017, 2018, 2019. About a half dozen, maybe more, right, Tom? Uh, of the experts we talked to said, there is a pandemic that will arrive in this country, and we aren't ready for it. We don't have a warning apparatus to alert us in specific ways, not just in general ways, but in specific ways of a disease when it arises. We certainly don't have an action apparatus that we can put into motion. Think of the levers a president might pull to be able to respond when that, when that crisis arises. We were being told about the experience we, we faced in COVID two years before that happened by experts in this field who knew as a country we weren't ready for it. 
So you have a Ukraine example of warning and action, not saying it was perfect, but it was designed to deal with that kind of problem. And then you had a pandemic arrive, and, and in which there was no specific warning mechanism. And we certainly know there was not an adequate action mechanism in place. We know about some of the things, and maybe we'll get back to this, Alex, about the vaccine that arrived in a year, which is amazing that that happened. That happened because the research for that vaccine began in 2003 during the anthrax crisis. We were talking to the to some of the scientific community that were pointing to those experiences. Had it not been for that and that scientific work, we would not have had a vaccine within a year. But think about the, the rush for masks, uh, the lack of adequate testing early on, the chaos in the supply chains that were going on. You can build an apparatus to deal with that. That takes time and attention and planning. And Alex, I think, will come back to that. Yeah, it's just a, a small asterisk, if I could. It goes back to my original point, which is that how you define a exactly. problem defines your options. We had never, this nation had never defined public health as a national security risk mm -hmm. until pandemic. And now it is. And there's resources, there's money and all that. And we go through the list, climate change, technology, other things, education. I mean, this country needs to redefine national security away from problems that you solve by blowing them up to problems that you solve by fixing them and mitigating them. And all of us as voters and taxpayers can make that happen. Oh, I, I have a follow-up. I totally agree. I, I, I have actually uh, follow-up questions on both Ukraine and COVID. <coughs> I mean, is, is there an apparatus in place right now regarding, you know, a second coming of a COVID that will help us manage it better, make, uh, ensure the safety of more people? And are we ready for it, such a thing now? Alex, ready? No. But a work in progress? Yes. Yeah. These things take time to build the machine, to have the organization, organizational apparatus, to have the, the mechanisms for being able to have resources turned on, turned off, the connectivity that you need from not only national decisions to states and localities. Uh, you know, we talked uh, to a terrific public health professional uh, who was referencing what was happening in the early days of COVID, the inability to even connect to states and localities as we were watching the numbers rise. The, the having to make up a COVID tracking that was really done at Johns Hopkins University. It was a graduate student who was monitoring what was happening in the world. We shouldn't have to rely on it. I mean, thank heavens for a graduate student, but we shouldn't have to rely on a graduate student for monitoring the outbreak of an enormous disease. The, this administration and the prior administration began putting things in, in place. There is a, a part of Health and Human Services. It's a it's a section of it that was formerly known as the, as the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. They've now turned that into an administration. That is, a, their, their job is to be ready for large uh, public health crises. They're building the tools. They're trying to build, they're building the connectivity to states and localities. They're building international connectivity. But it's not all in place. Think back to COVID, and Alex, you and I were talking about this, to you know, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, who stands up as sort of very instrumental during that crisis. He said the National Institutes for Health. This is not his job. I mean, his job is to be studying and analyzing this, but he was never given a command headquarters that, like the way you think of the military. He didn't have connections to the broader community, the international apparatus. That was being done on the fly. So if we're serious, as Tom says, about treating this as a national security question, then we need to build the same kind of machinery for this, that we need to think about it the way we would do for war. Now, we're not suggesting in this book that we have to open the coffers and spend huge amounts of money. What we want to suggest, let's build the planning. Uh, let's exercise. Let's have the people that will have to interact with each other do so on a regular basis. 
Once a month, have a planning session. Run through scenarios. The Pentagon's famous for war games. We run these at RAND often. In which you deal with problems so that you learn ahead of time what the mistakes are so that you're not dealing with those mistakes during a crisis. Those are the kind of things that we need to be building. So when it has, when you talk about it, yes, we're building the machinery, but it's not yet all. Yeah. Well, I may want to get back to that, but what I would like to do now is get back to Ukraine for, for a minute. Because most of the news that's coming out now is not particularly good. Um, the, the, uh, the backing of, of our efforts in Ukraine have started to fray at the seams, or maybe even in the middle in this country. Um, there's news, I think, in today's paper, or yesterday's paper, that there's some, you know, differences of opinion on how this should be carried out by the Ukrainian uh, people uh, with, with, with the people in the Pentagon. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, Putin is making noises about nuclear warfare. And I, I, I have a feeling that might be pegged to the fact that if you believe Tom Friedman, which I definitely do, um, uh, the uh, Russian army has lost two-thirds of its manpower and uh, many of the eligible uh, draftees in Russia are leaving the country in droves, um, which uh, given that Putin is not the kind of guy who backs down, he's now making nuclear threats. Uh, do you think those are realistic? I mean, if you had to assess them? So I would never bet against what Putin says. He has the option, as someone who's read Soviet and Russian war fighting doctrine, nuclear weapons are part of their war fighting arsenal very, very differently than here in the West. That said, for the time being, it's hard to see a battlefield utility for tactical nuclear weapons. So I would never discount it. I would say, you know, I'm not going to say don't worry about it. But as of today, I don't think there's the real threat. But the themes of our book about institutions and machines, this country does have machines for dealing with a problem like Moscow ordering the invasion of a neighboring independent democracy, right? We worked on that machine for 50 years. It's called NATO. And as Andy said, the second invasion of Ukraine two years ago, we were sort of ready for it. And Andy and I are both very apolitical, we're very nonpartisan, but that can't prevent us from looking at the facts of what's going on on the ground. U.S. support for Ukraine has totaled like 5% of the Pentagon's budget. So for a nickel on every dollar, we've been supporting Ukrainians in fighting and dying to defend not just their country, but the integrity of the Western alliance and the support for democratic governance. I was on the ground in Ukraine on my baby son's first birthday when Ukraine voted for independence after the collapse of communism, a moment of great hope. So I feel this very, very deeply. And you don't have to be partisan to say this country used to stand for values that supported independence and integrity and sovereignty against aggressors. Nobody's talking about sending US boots on the ground. There's no reason for Americans to die because Ukrainians are extremely patriotic. But both parties, going back to Ronald Reagan, Democrats, would be supporting Ukraine with weapons and money right now. And it's a dysfunctional situation in Washington. Both sides are guilty, but it's hard for me to believe that we are not going to continue supporting Ukrainians in fighting and dying for values that we support. Alex, I want to come back to your question about the risk of nuclear escalation. It's a very serious one. Uh, this administration, I know, uh, had to face that early because Putin was quite um, clear about his statements. My own assessment, Tom, I'll be interested in your view. My own assessment is the risk was probably not so great over what happened in Ukraine, 
but perhaps greater last summer when one of Putin's own commanders, Prigozhin, and the Wagner Group was marching on Moscow. Yeah. To the extent that this war brings a risk to Putin, his closest parties, his rule in Russia, I think the risk of nu nuclear escalation is great. I think the fighting over Ukraine, and I don't want to dismiss the risk, I think we could go, we could be um, underestimating what could happen. But I think that risk of what really happened, what could have happened last summer, was greater in terms of Putin's own position for power. Yeah. Don't ever threaten you know, a totalitarian that has control of nuclear weapons. That's, that's a risk that really worries me. Tom, I'm curious about your own view. No, I agree. And that's why you know, the Biden administration, I think, has gotten it right. They've never called for the Russian people to rise up against Putin. They're, they're, they're not calling for him to be ousted. You know, the White House is talking about war crimes on the ground, so Putin would only go the nuclear option. It's like the story of Samson in the Old Testament. I mean, if Putin drops nukes on Ukraine, he's pulling down the temple around him. And so I think it really is, it would be an act of desperation. And one can see at that point, a group of people around him who thus far love the Swiss bank accounts, love, the good life saying, the boss wants to nuke Ukraine. So there's a very interesting dynamic there where, as Andy said, he might do it as a last resort, but that actually might accelerate that last resort against him. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, nobody's gonna sleep tonight, so I'll give you my cell phone number, you can call me at the hotel, we can talk each other off the ceiling. Okay. Well, another uh, uh, subject that I wanted to touch on, which uh, you know, it, it touches on all of the things we'll talk about uh, tonight. You too will, um, and and that's the division in our own country. It seems like I mean we were talking earlier. You said I said I don't think this country has been this split since the Vietnam War. And uh, Andy, what did you say? There's I think I'd go back to the 1930s. I think we were more divided then, even in the context of the Vietnam War. There were deep divisions. Yeah. But there weren't deep divisions about America's role in the world. You know, we were still unified as a country about our role in the world, our place in the economy, you know, in the global economy. There weren't deep divisions about our leadership in NATO, other things we were doing. We were divided over our involvement in a particular war. But I think there was a still, you know, uh, general unanimity about America's role in the world and the value of leadership. In the 1930s, that was not true. Yeah. That was not true until the run-up of, until the actual onset of the Second World War. Uh, you know, I was impressed, by the way, in the entrance of the school to see the documents that are there in the front. I don't know how many high schools in this country have the documents that have the Paris Treaty, a copy of the Paris Treaty. But I was also impressed to see Roosevelt's Four Freedoms. That was his design for the world that would come. That speech was given in January of 1941, 11 months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. It's remarkable. But that was reflection, that was Roosevelt's effort to try to bring this country together, to have a vision of where we were going. And we were deeply, deeply divided in the 1930s about our world before. Do you see any... We're as deeply divided today. Yeah, do you see any signs that this could lessen? Frankly, I don't, the divisions I mean. <laughs> Elections have consequences, right? Yeah. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I think there are real choices uh, in terms of the direction we're going. And, you know, on some matters, by the way, I want to be clear, it's not that we're divided on everything. We saw from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, policies on China were much more ones of continuity than they were of division. But we are divided about our role in Europe. In Europe. Yeah. We are divided about the importance of NATO. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, we've talked about the war in Ukraine. Uh, we're divided on other issues as well. So 
I don't want to paint this as entirely as, as that there are divisions are across the board, but we're uh, divided on some very important fundamental topics. And the U.S. leadership role in the world and the role of alliances, I think, is one of the key questions. There's a shorthand we use in the book. Um, I, I, it, was, uh, it was said to me by a foreign diplomat two decades ago when we were talking about America's role and really about what American strategy is. And that diplomat said, oh, it's simple. What America's done since the end of World War II is two things done them very well. Make friends and keep threats at a distance. That's why we form alliances. You make friends to keep threats at a distance. We have less clarity, I think, today on what friendships in the world really mean and how that connects ultimately to strategy and what our role in the world really is all about. I think that's a debate the country really needs to have. Well, what about our other big non-friend? China. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, let me get us started there, and I know Tom will have some things to say. Uh, there are lots of places we could start. I'm going to take us to the early months of 2001. This is when Tom and I were getting to know each other. I was the head of strategy in the Pentagon. There was a new administration arrives, Bush administration. Uh, I'm running the strategy review for Don Rumsfeld and ultimately for the president. And it was at that moment that many of us, many of those that were looking, this is the warning in action machine, so let's go back to the machine. The warning apparatus is telling us that China has plans and is growing and is going to be building a military capability. It was going to take some time. This was not, you know, this was not an emergency in which we needed to get uh, focused and, and to, to with with, uh, you know, with great alarm to prepare for a threat from China. But it was a signal that things were changing <clears throat> and that we ought to be taking this seriously. We ought to be thinking about what this meant. Back to alliances, what it meant for our partnerships in Asia. How were our partnerships thinking and dealing with this? Uh, how were we building capabilities to be able to defend in places like Taiwan or Japan, uh, the Philippines, should, should that apply? We have treaty relationships with Japan and with the Philippines. We have a defense relationship with Taiwan that comes out of the agreement that President Carter signed uh, in 1979, the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, in all of those instances, what we were doing is we were looking at our own war games, we talked about war games earlier, telling us that the kind of capability that China was building was going to make it very difficult for us to defend allies, to be a good partner to them. And we would need changes in our own capabilities. Uh, that strategy review was going to be putting us on a different trajectory, but for 9-11. And at the moment 9-11 arri arrived, tragic day, I was in the Pentagon. Uh, the floors in that building, it was like an earthquake. The windows broke. We had to evacuate. And I was back in a burning building at 6.30 a.m. the next morning because I had a call from the Secretary of Defense who said I need to see you. And uh, we were focused now. We knew we were going to be on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, we were going to focus on this problem of terrorism. But there was no expectation in 2001 that that was going to be for the next 20 years. And yet we could still see this challenge that we would face with China. Now, at that moment, even though the national security community saw China's rise as a challenge, the business community was in a very different place. The business community in this country was thinking more about business opportunities, about work that could be done in China. And that is fine. These can run on parallel tracks. And they did for some time, until she arrived as General Secretary of the Communist Party. At that moment, the business community this is 2012, 13, 14. The business community knows things are different. The national security community is already thinking about this. But time has elapsed. And so Tom described the challenge that we faced with Russia as hiding in plain sight. We focused on this and saw this as the, the challenge that was um, uh, sitting there in a the distance, but the time that elapsed. 
And it's a real concern that from 2001, in which this focus was supposed to be on China, but turns to terrorism, another 20 years elapses. And we're now faced with the moment that should we have to defend Taiwan, or face defending Japan, or threats to the Philippines, that, uh, that opportunity has lapsed. We went from a position of utter military superiority, and I'll come back to explain what we mean by that, to one of parity, or maybe even less than that. In 1996, uh, there, was a, there was a crisis over Taiwan. China had fired some missiles to the left and to the right of the island. Artillerymen know what that means. They refer to that as bracketing a target. You can fire to the left, which means if you can fire to the left and to the right, you can fire to the middle as well. It was a signal to Taiwan. We sent aircraft carriers in response to that threat. Uh, the, we sent, in fact, President Clinton just sent, uh, directed the two aircraft carriers, moved to the Taiwan Strait, one arrived, China stepped down because it knew it couldn't face the power of the United States Navy. We would not send an aircraft carrier into the Taiwan Strait in a crisis today because the military, the, the capabilities China has built since that time would threaten the United States Navy and the presence of the United States. So there's this moment in time in which we could have prepared, but we didn't prepare. And now we face this urgency. Uh, and so that represents a different kind of danger for us, for us. One in which the warning machine was sending the message, this is coming, but the action machine wasn't keeping up. Very different kind of problem. And it goes back to our comment about definitions really matter. And as a recovering journalist, I really object when I read great power rivalry, great power competition with Russia and China as if it's the same. It's not, and to lump them together is a failure of analysis. People often ask me, is there a new Cold War with Russia? I say no, because Putin's already at war with us. Putin has the rheostat, hot, medium, whatever. A virtue of democracy, it's hard to take us to war, not so in Russia. Everything Putin is doing is preparing for a war, not just, not only a shooting war, but just a hot rivalry with us. Whereas China has so many more interests in stability. I mean, the global economy matters to China in ways it just doesn't matter to Putin. And that influences their decision. So of course I agree with everything that Andy says, but my take on China is a little bit different. Please stand by for a horrible analogy. But you know, one of the most meaningful parts of my post New York Times life I work at GW, but I'm a volunteer at the McLean Volunteer Fire Department. I've learned so much from the career guys. They study now not firefighting. They study fire suppression. Because with the way buildings are built, alarms, sprinklers, and all of that, fortunately, house fires and building fires will never be eliminated. But they're so less common today, and that's a great thing. You can never eliminate heart attacks, but we just put a third ambulance so we get to people with heart attacks faster. That's how we have to approach China. We don't want to get into fires with China, military. We want to suppress the competition in ways that we can have a global engagement with a country that we're never going to agree with. And I think you can do that through right decisions because you want the Chinese leadership to say, war will not be in our best interest. And there are ways to posture ourselves militarily, diplomatically, economically, that will save the Chinese leadership, not today. And we need to have a whole bunch of those not todays in the world. That work for you? No argument. Except, <laughs> except, except, those kayaks, except the fire suppression is not in place. Right? That's the piece we have to work on. And Alex, I want to I want to tell a little story about the book about, about this book because one of the things that was so interesting for Tom and me was to meet the, the people that are working on these problems. Yeah. And so we meet this physicist who comes from Caltech, who's working with the Air Force. And the Air Force, by the way, knows it has a problem. The Navy knows it has a problem. 
Um, they know, they thought time was on their side in 2001. They now know time's not on their side. But this physicist is helping the Air Force think about how do I build that suppression? Um, and the Air Force has got this uh, unmanned aircraft they're working on. They call it the LCAT. Or the it's fairly large, it would fly. It would, its job is really to provide surveillance, to send messages about what's happening. Uh, the only way China can, could invade Taiwan is to send ships across the Taiwan Strait. You can't fly enough people over and land them to do this effectively. You've got to do this by sea. And so if you want to suppress this fire that you're talking about, I love your metaphor, then you need to have a surveillance system to let you know if there are going to be ships that are moving and what the ships are. This is how you create the architecture of deterrence. The, the way you deter is through the real prospect of failure. You don't want a leader to think, today's the day I could possibly carry this out. And so anyway, this physicist is working with the, the Air Force. Uh, they've got their LCAT or CAT. But he decides it's too expensive. We'll never have enough. What you really need is not a cat, but a kitten. And he literally designs a little unmanned aircraft that has inexpensive sensor technology. Um, in which you couldn't, you don't put these up in dozens or hundreds, you put them up in thousands. You think of, you know, small drones that you would send fly thousands of times. They've experimented with this. This, phys this physicist and this three-star general you read about in the book, it's a great story. Last summer, the Deputy Secretary of Defense announced a replicator program based on the idea of this physicist and his kittens. It's a remarkable story of American ingenuity, of somebody who's looking at a problem and understands what it's going to take to create the suppression that you're talking about. It's likely to happen. Well, I think that's the most positive part of your, your book. <laughs> but not just Maybe that the one, only positive. I don't mean that, that specifically. That is a positive. But I mean, you, you talk about, I, I mean, I think of poli policy wonks now in a totally different way after reading your book. Because this book is not only descriptive, and, and very clearly so, but it's also prescriptive. And, and, and your, your outlook on the future is not negative by any means. And it, and it, and it, there are problems that can be solved here. That can be solved. And, and I think that's the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the strong point you made uh, in that last chapter, is that we, you know, if people are, uh, can, can be allowed to do what they know needs to be done, uh, a lot of this can be overcome, or at least dealt with. So, um, Anyway, uh, I don't know if it's, should we be thinking now of throwing this out to... Um, <coughs> I'd love to hear questions from the audience. Okay, before I do though, I'm going to read you this quote that you know only so well if I can find it. Um, oh, I seem to have lost the place. This is, what's his name, e Eric Edelman? It's Eric Edelman. The end of the first section. The first section. You're probably close to it there. <laughs> I mean, this, this sums up, hey, uh, yeah, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, got it, okay. I'm just going to read this passage from the book. Because he's, just as he's doing that, this is, this is somebody Tom and I know very, very well. He's yes. a very smart person. Okay, here's the quote. We sometimes act if all of this is just so easy, said Eric Edelman a four-decade pillar of American national security as the Defense Department's Undersecretary for Policy, a real wonk and a good one, considered the number three post, Pentagon post, as well as Ambassador to Turkey and Finland. There are a lot of historians who look back at all of this and say, well, they should have known this and they should have known that, Edelman added. In response to such claims, he cites the work of a British historian, Ian Kershaw, who defined the challenge this way, history has lived forward, but it is only understood backward. The reason we get things wrong so much in national security, Edelman concluded, 
is because it's really fucking hard. <laughs> that, that pretty much if Eric's only complaint goes afterwards, he said, my mom read that quote. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, should we now, are we at that point where we should throw I think we saw the questions answer. up? We got some questions from the audience. According to your thesis, there has to be a war machine and then you take action? Warning. 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 You have to be okay. alerted to a problem. How about our red-headed warning person <laughs> in our society who Talk says, from day one, I'll be a dictator? Right. Only on day one. So but what, what is your advice? <coughs> So I'll take a crack at that without advocating how you should vote. That's not my job. Um, but clearly this next election could be historic. Um, one of the most important in our history. And I think, again, being a political nonpartisan, um, super quick story. Okay? So it's the 2004 presidential election. Um, walking down the hall of the Pentagon. Bush's Iraq campaign is failing. John Kerry's running. Rumsfeld sees me coming with his posse, coming to a press conference. He says, Shanker, what are you doing here? I said, well, Mr. Secretary, I still work here, and unless you ban me from the building. He said, no, no, no. What I meant was I thought every New York Times reporter was out campaigning for John Kerry. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Secretary, I'll bet you a case of beer you can't tell me how I vote. He said, of course I can. You're a liberal Democrat, you're voting for Kerry. I said, pay up, I don't vote. <laughs> and he paid up. So, so I, I can answer your question with that same attitude, which is, if you look at what happened in Israel with Netanyahu, if you look around the world, if a country is polarized, it's not safe. If a country is divided, it's not healthy. And so all of you need to go home, and you think about between now and November, Think about electing people up and down the ballot who represent the kind of centrist, bipartisan values that Andy and I are advocating, and we'll make this country, you know. Great again. <laughs> <laughs> not the words I, I was using, but, but again, I'm, I'm not advocating yeah. either way. But that this country had a history of, especially in foreign policy, coming together. We need to find that again. I mean, the problem is, as a media guy, is we become so atomized and individual. We all get information on our phone that's only information we already know we want to know about. So it's no wonder we're so polarized. We need to go from the daily me back to the daily we. I want to go back to something that Alex raised earlier as well. The notion that the United States, that we as a population have been uh, unified on issues of foreign policy is actually a fairly brief moment in the history of this country. That is the period from the end of the Second World War, well, it's leaves, will include the Second World War in there until the early 2000s, we'll say until shortly in the aftermath of the 2001 attack on this country. It begins to fray, certainly, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Vietnam, I mean. Uh, but for much of our country, much of our history, we have Vietnam. But I mentioned the 30s before. Of course, we fought a war with each other in the Civil War. For much of the history of this country, we have been divided on some of these topics. And so elections have consequences. And I think people have to choose and choose the directions they want to go. I, as someone who has served as part of the national security apparatus, I have a very firm belief about, and from my own, of my own, about the importance of American leadership in this world. I know in the absence of American leadership in this world what the consequences have been for the country. I think it's important that we lead, but this, the people of this country have to make a choice about the directions we want to go. And that choice is, is one that we're gonna face, not only in terms of who we choose for president, but who occupies positions in Congress, 
the decisions that our courts make. Uh, we have a whole apparatus here in this country, and you know, those are choices that the people in this country are going to have to make. I think the really scary thing, frankly, uh, to me anyway, is, is violence. And I, I just think that um, that it's been raised so frequently now in the, in the sort of political dialogue violent words, violent insults, violent threats, that people are, uh, you know... And it was I, George Washington who set the standard for the peaceful transfer of power in this country. Yeah. We need to abide by it. Well, it would certainly be nice if we did. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, am I choosing? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll keep an eye on this. Okay, and I'll be coming over there. Go ahead. Having grown up in D.C., in my older place, um, I know nothing. We'll repeat the question. We can hear. Having grown up in D.C. and a political family, I know nothing. <laughs> All I know is I think it starts at a local level. So get involved in your town politics, strengthen, you know, strengthening it from the, you know, just the beginning out, right? So um, I think that's really, really crucial. And also, in terms of like Trump and Ukraine, if he wins, what are you going to do, right? Except you have to in involve yourself in local politics and national politics, but starting at the local level. But also, I have a question. Okay, which question? <laughs> My question is. So I work in healthcare, and recently the entire um, East Coast has been hacked, okay, in terms of hospitals, insurance, people can't get their medicines, providers can't get paid, and so where is that coming from? China. Is that, is that, you know, uh, is that China. cyber security? Um, warfare? Is that internal? What, what's happening? Right. Uh, the first answer is I don't know where it's yeah. coming from. But let's talk about what it might, where it might be coming from. You didn't repeat the question. <laughs> That's a good reminder. The question is, she works in healthcare, and she's reminding us of the recent attacks on the information systems that provide the healthcare infrastructure, the backbone, the ability to access records, the ability to have accurate billing, the ability to have uh, prescription drugs, and, and all of the information systems we depend upon, and these are now proving to be vulnerable. Right, so I just want to say another thing. So I, I'm now working for free because I care about the kids I work with. But I also know cybersecurity is the warfare of the future. I grew up in DC, right? And so we need to be more aware of where this is coming from and how it's happening. So, I mean, we chat about cyber warfare. And again, in our book, we have a whole chapter. And one of the things we try to do, just as you're saying, this country needs to make data and cyber a security threat on the level of China or Russia or climate or other things. And so we advocate exactly the sorts of norms that you're looking for. What's going to cause or require is a much greater public-private partnership because United Healthcare, just like the gasoline pipeline, uh, the, these, these, co these companies need to trust the government where all the best toys are for cyber warfare and cyber defense. So Andy's talked about new ways of approaching, creating new machines. We need a new machine to create better cyber defenses because this is just the start. First part of her question was about being active on the local level. I do a lot of uh, speaking on college campuses. What I, what I tell these young people is, you know, everything important I learned in life, I learned from three people. Johnny Cash, my wife, and the US Army. <laughs> what I learned from the Army is, you can't solve problems divided into strategic, operational, and tactical. Few of us get to operate at the real strategic level by writing partner for Andy Owen, world strategies. 
There are maybe some retired colonels and generals in the audience. Great. Most of us live at the tactical level, day to day, our communities. And the question about how we get back to normal, what you say, we can all impact our communities by being contributors to community life and not just consumers. Through your place of worship, school, community club, healthcare, volunteer fire department. And I know many people in this audience certainly do, but that's where you have to start. So, uh, These folks are spending their Friday evening with us. They're thinking about this. I want to speak specifically to your question about information infrastructure. There was a time we thought, when it was thought, that protecting the government communications was the way that we would make the country secure. That isn't true anymore. That's far from true. And so this has to become not just a government activity. Tom's alluding to it. This is a, uh, and this is not just a national, state, and local activity. This is a public-private partnership to make the inf information secure. We had a fascinating, fascinating discussion on just this topic with former National Security Advisor Steve Hadley. And Hadley was really, when we were talking about the recommendations that Alex was pointing to, he said, we have to think about this in a way that the, the private sector, the, the, in this case, the health community, but in other cases, transportation and other elements, they have to feel free enough to share their own vulnerabilities without the government setting up gotchas. Hadley's worry was, this is never going to work if the health, the larger health apparatus brings vulnerabilities to the government to help get them fixed. And somebody in this Security and Exchange <coughs> Commission is now undertaking an audit because of a particular information that's shared. Nobody's talking about, about dismissing criminal behavior or that sort of thing. But there's going to have to be an element of trust if this is going to work. And that partnership isn't just about national, state, and local, but it's going to involve the private sector because the private sector holds so much of the critical, uh, critical information. Those, those pieces are being built right now, but they're far from, from, they're far from ready. And of course, you see the vulnerabilities yeah, right in front I, of you. I, 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 my question is, how and when did Putin come to power, and what's keeping him in power? All I remember is Khrushchev when I was in high school banging shoe on the table in the United Nations. Yeah, so Putin came into power again when we weren't paying attention. Uh, he was a KGB colonel in East Germany. He, here's a man who said that the most catastrophic event of the 20th century wasn't trench warfare, gassing in World War I, wasn't the Holocaust. It was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay, I kind of disagree with that. I'm sure most of us do. I mean, Putin feels the collapse of the Soviet Union was the worst of in the 20th century. Yes. He is a KGB trained, KGB apparatchik. I met him seven or eight times. He's a completely gray man. You can miss him in a room of two, except he knows how to operate. Okay. An artist. Well, he. And how he stays in power, fear, money, and a police state. And those are pretty powerful things. But we let it happen because we weren't paying attention. Well, we didn't let him. It happened with him coming to power. But we were not. We clearly weren't cognizant Thank you. of the challenges. Right. That Thank, you. Thank you, Andy, as always. He's my editor. We didn't let him or not let him, but we weren't paying attention to a clear and present danger. In our book, we call him the threat hiding in plain sight, because he was. Whole group of you guys choose. <laughs> you folks choose. How about the, how about the woman right here? Oh. In right, yes. Uh, and uh, P.S., there's a wonderful play um, on now called Patriots, that the rise of uh, uh, 
Very interesting. Um, I'm just curious about the atmosphere of the Defense Department. Um, I'm imagining all these offices, each one has an emergency, you know, a global emergency, and how how it's chosen what the direction is going to be now. And also, how does this compare to the Chinese setup of a defense department? I'll say a little bit about that. The question was, how are we organized in the Defense Department to deal with all these different kind of problems? And how does that compare with what China's doing? So let's talk about the broadest sense. As a nation, we have interests in far flung places in the world. In Europe, you can see now, in Europe, the Middle East, we do worry about security in East Asia. We have built the apparatus to be able to keep our attention on different things. And it's not just the Pentagon. I mean, the Pentagon is the headquarters. But we have a command structure in which we have military commanders that are responsible for planning in different parts of the world. Uh, one of the things we cite in this book is a remarkable thing that happened in the Defense Department in the 1980s. It was the Goldwater-Nichols Reform Act. Anybody that was in the military will be aware of that. But that was the realization that our defense uh, uh, apparatus wasn't functioning then as it should. You'll recall the Iranian res rescue crisis in the 70s in which there was, you know, it was a reasonable plan and it was an utter failure because the military itself wasn't well coordinated. This is how we got the idea of joint activities. That is, the, Ar the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, now Space Corps, and the Coast Guard. They each present capabilities, but they have to be knit together. They have to plan, train, and operate. They have to have ready capabilities. Not ready two weeks from now, not ready two months from now, ready tonight. That's how they think about problems. They build scenarios. I was a part of the, uh, part of the group that provided the scenarios for the department. These are challenges, so as to be ready for, for problems when they arise. You're never gonna be perfectly ready, but you can be ready for a lot of these things. This is exactly what Tom and I are talking about for other kinds of problems. Health preparedness problems would be a good one. Cyber, or what we call digits, those, this is another area where we need to do this. Climate, which uh, Tom spent time writing and thinking about. Uh, climate is a real problem, it's presenting real challenges. That needs planning and so forth. So the military has a way of organizing this, but the national security problems we're facing as a country are bigger than the military. So we're talking about building the machinery for for, for the other parts of the government so that they can function the way the military has and, and has learned from it. And we don't want to suggest the military is perfect by any means, but they, it's an organization that, that really is organized around planning and preparation. And if you're going to deal with problems, planning and preparation is really essential. And at the very center of your question is a very important thought, which is that for a president, the inbox is always full. For the White House, they're concerned about winning that news cycle or the next election. And one of the things that Andy and I advocate is the future needs a seat at the table. Because these problems are not just today or tomorrow. And the system is still not designed for looking around the corner or toward the horizon. And that's why with COVID, climate change, about which I'm obsessed, they have risen to the level of national security threats, and they need to be it's almost too late so, today. <laughs> Somebody decide. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, two things. If you're concerned about climate change, you might not use plastic. But putting that aside, just to lighten you up, could you tell us about Johnny Cash? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good question. I mean, Good what, question. I, what I learned from Johnny Cash is a basic principle of being a good husband, or trying to be a good husband, good dad, good journalist, good friend, you gotta walk the line. <laughs> it's not hard to be a good person. Just walk the line. <laughs> okay, somebody out there, yeah, they've been hands up. We've had three hands up there. Uh, earlier you mentioned the United States' military alliances with Japan and Philippines and also South Korea, and I was just wondering your takes on 
recent, in recent years, the debate and tension about the possibility of places like South Korea obtaining weapons of, nu weapons of mass destruction, even though they already fall under a nuclear umbrella, and how that affects national security. That is a terrific question. That's on people's minds all the time. And this is a good way to probe the importance of an alliance. So if we think about a country like South Korea or Japan, I put Taiwan into the same group, the confidence of they could have by being an ally with the United States, and you mentioned the nuclear umbrella, the idea that they don't need nuclear weapons because we promise to come to their defense should they face a threat, uh, even to the extent of needing, even if required, using our own nuclear, nuclear weapons in their defense. That's the arrangement that we have. Absent that kind of assurance that comes from being able to rely on an ally like the United States, I think there's a very serious risk that South Korea or Japan or Taiwan or others would then ask themselves, how do we provide for our own security? And nuclear weapons is certainly one of the real options they would face. So when we think about this issue of the importance of alliances, yes, it's what we bring to them, but it's also what they're choosing not to do instead. And so if a world in which there are many more nuclear powers, in which the risk of nuclear war would rise perhaps considerably, if that is concerning to you, then the focus on the alliance relationships that we've been talking about, the assurance that comes from that, that ought to be a mainstay of US policy. Absent that mainstay, I think the risk of nuclear proliferation, that is, more countries possessing nuclear weapons, and therefore the risk that some of those countries might use those weapons, that risk rises considerably. And it's a that, really, really good question. And add to that list Saudi Arabia and any number of countries in the Gulf who have all the money necessary. Okay, up there. They've had their hands up for a while. Some, somebody. So, I, I share your obsession with climate change, and I bet a lot of people in this room do. So I'd love to hear just a little bit more about how the national security world is thinking about it and approaching it. Sure. Thanks so much. So one of our bumper stickers is climate security is national security. You'll be tired of me saying it, but this too is a place where there should be a bipartisan coming together. Red and blue, red states, blue, blue states. In the strictly military sense, with rising sea levels, really important installations will be underwater. And there's not enough money in the Pentagon budget to lift Norfolk and Coronado and the others. Also the level of national, national security, this is Andy's wonderful phrase, climate change is a threat multiplier. Every threat around the world is made worse because of climate change. Forced migration by the hundreds of millions. Um, piracy off the horn of Africa. Those were fishermen who couldn't fish anymore. The Syrian civil war, drought related, right? So even though it's not directly our national security, it affects what our military and government has to deal with. The National Guard, which is deployed overseas with active duty forces for every war except Vietnam, they're gonna be home forever fighting wildfires, dealing with hurricane and all that. And the reason I think there could be a coming together is on both sides of the aisle, people get it. I was talking to a South Texas real estate developer, big commercial real estate guy, South Texas, very red state. He said, all the guys he plays golf with don't believe in climate change. He wants them to meet his insurance adjuster, <laughs> right? I was speaking up at the University of Wyoming, super red state. A cattle rancher came up afterwards and said all of his surface water on his cattle ranch plastic from China carried on these atmospheric oceans. And it's not poisonous yet, but it will be someday. So climate change is an issue that there has to be a coming together because it is a huge national security risk. All the departments have documents about it, but Andy and I interviewed the Pentagon's former chief climate person, and she said, all the right words are there but a plan without a budget is a fantasy. Mm -hmm. And here's the real nightmare scenario. 
We interviewed the Navy's top medical officer, a real a rear admiral. What keeps him up at night is with the melting ice caps. Viruses and disease that have not been set free on the human race since we were cave people are going to be set loose again, and his Navy's going to sail into it first. It's a real national security issue. Yes, ma'am. Go. Um, at the risk of opening a can of worms, <coughs> can you... We can open another can of worms. Can, right. you, can you address <coughs> the complexity of the Israel situation? Thank you. The elephant in the room. Yeah, the question was about the, 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 the war in Gaza right now and the situation involving Israel and Palestine. <coughs> Uh, if you're a reader of this book, we did not anticipate that happening. Right. Uh, if you're the National Security Advisor of the United States, you did not anticipate yeah. that happening. Uh, it is an enormous, enormous <coughs> problem. Uh, it's a ticking time bomb that's been sitting there for a long, long time. You know, resolution of that, I think, is very hard to imagine. Uh, what took place in early October is horrific. Uh, by, any, by any standard. Uh, my own view is Israel had a responsibility to respond to that. But it's also my own view that uh, protection of, of uh, non-combatants, civilians in war, is an obligation of any country. It's an obligation of every country. Uh, I have a colleague at RAND who wrote a very important report about our own civilian casualties when we were fighting in the Middle East, and how well we did or didn't do, and in some cases we didn't do well. And there is an office in place now, uh, a new office has been created, that is responsible for working with the combatant commands. These are the planning apparatus, the, the planning, uh, those responsible for planning, for thinking just about that question. He's taken on this job. This is a responsibility Israel has as it's fighting this war. And I think the United States, as Israel's lone ally left in the world, has got to make this case over and over and over again. Uh, there's no easy solution to this. Those that listen to the State of the Union heard the President's position on this last evening. Uh, you know, it's something that, uh, uh, you know, I think the United States has a responsibility to stand up for the rights, not only of our ally in Israel, but of the civilians that are being affected here. And it's, I think it's deeply, deeply concerning to me. I, on, on that subject, um, I remember at the end of the 73 war um, in, in the Middle East, um, the Egyptians had pushed into the desert, the Third Army, I think, <clears throat> and they were um, surrounded. They'd done quite well, but then they were surrounded by the Israelis and there was this critical point reached where um, the Israelis were in a position to humiliate <coughs> the Egyptians. And, um, and by, by, by um, you know, showing that they'd clearly been defeated. And Russia um, started to get stroppy and things started to heat up. And America told Israel that um, you, you better let food and water into the, um, into that army, that surrounded army, or we're going to do it. And it seems to me that um, America has lost that authority. Well, it's lost a couple of things in the Middle East, it seems, it seems that we're paying for now, that the world seems to be paying for. Um, it, it, it won't crack the whip with Israel anymore. It seems to me, you know, we say it was very complicated or it's a very difficult situation, but I don't see how it would have been so complicated for America to tell Israel that we want a two-state solution. Yeah. And that it doesn't seem that complicated a solution. When I was living out there, the people who are now running Israel were, were the fringe. They were you know, people who were advocating settlements and a permanent settlement of the West Bank were the fringe. That's what we believe. That, you know, that there would be a two-state solution ultimately. That, you know, and of course, you know, then you've got these right-wing governments came in and labor fell apart. And, and Israel got, I think, more interested 
in affluence and people got apathetic and, they, and, and, and less interest. Sorry, I'm going on too much. Yeah, but I mean, all I would say, sir, is, as Andy said, yeah. elections matter. Yes. They matter in Israel. Yeah. They matter. But America, I think, had a role here. That it should, you know, I think America has been way too soft on a country that it's been um, 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 providing huge no, I would say is that you should vote accordingly. Find the candidate that represents you. Well, you. Sir, I'm, I'm sorry. This can go on all night long. Yeah. Right. I, so. I, I, will, I will make one comment. This is playing out in very quickly. Uh, I think we are taking a position on Israel right now. We are taking a fairly strong one. And I, I think it would be perfectly reasonable to say it's happened too slowly. That wouldn't be the first time in which we responded too slowly, but we are responding as a country, and I think it's important that we do so. And, and my lesson would be a bit different. I mean, Alex talked about my first book with Eric Schmidt, which looked at 10 years of counterterrorism. Um, I think someone should sit the Israeli leadership down and sort of talk about how you don't, you can stack your enemies, you can, you can stack the corpses out of cordwood. And that will not solve the problem right. until you get to the underlying causes of terrorism in your enemy action. Poverty, poverty of hope, poverty of opportunity, poverty of education. So that is the solution. Yeah. Just as it took this country 20 years of counterterrorism to realize, oh, we can't kill everybody. Anybody who claims to be a friend of Israel or, or a supporter of Israel would have been advocating a two-state solution this whole time, going back decades. <coughs> Next question. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, how about that? Just behind you, and they'll come here. I have a civil one. You had mentioned it earlier. You were talking about um, our superiority in weapons and in the Navy and in the Air Force. And you sort of indicated that that is not the case anymore. I'm curious to hear where you feel we are compared to China and Russia as far as our military power, especially considering how much money we do spend. Yes, on that. Uh, I'll try to keep this very brief, and I'll use just one illustration. Uh, the way we thought about using our Air Force for decades was you would fly your Air Force close to the place where it would operate. Think about what happened in the Middle East wars. We would fly our Air Force to these forward operating bases, and then the Air Force would fly and undertake its missions. What China understood was you didn't have to kill the Air Force in the sky. You just had to eliminate its ability to bring its Air Force back to the runways. And so it built missiles. And it built missiles not in the hundreds, but in the thousands. And as long as you can keep runways damaged and runways uh, inoperable, and Air Force can't fly. Mm -hmm. That's what happened, and that was, so that, you know, that required technology of, of it's one thing to fire missiles, it's another thing to have missiles that are accurate, accurate enough to be able to puncture runway. China possesses that capability now. So that has the Air Force thinking about how you could use unmanned systems, how they can be dispersed in different areas. There's a lot of very interesting uh, thinking. Those same missiles that can punch holes in runways can target aircraft carriers. And so now the aircraft carriers that you would depend upon to fly the fighter aircraft and, and, and the uh, uh, ele electronic aircraft and so forth, they can't get close enough to the operations for those aircraft to be effective. So there's a whole range of different thinking, longer range aircraft, uh, I mentioned dispersed, you know, air, aircraft operating from the dispersed locations and so forth. But it's a very different way of thinking about how we're going to use technology and warfare. And I guess the concern that we raised, that I raised in writing this book, we knew all of that 25 years ago. It just took too long for us to begin changing how we were thinking about our own use of technology. We knew that 25 years ago. Okay, I got a signal, but one more question. Um, and I think we, we we promised this gentleman in the red sweater. Thank you. Uh, just one comment, which was apparently uh, on an open mic yesterday, Biden said that he needed to have a discussion with Netanyahu and have a come to Jesus moment. So even though not a good metaphor, yeah, probably not the best. <laughs> <laughs> that's just not, saying, that's folks. nothing to do with my question, but it may address. Uh, 
the kinds of thinking that, that goes on internally rather than publicly. Um, my question is, I understand that China and Russia and Iran have all indicated that they want to unravel the post-World War II rules-based organization. And my question for you is, do you think that the uh, war in Ukraine, the attack on Israel, and the actions by China with respect to Taiwan are all intentionally coordinated to achieve that goal. I'll take a crack at it, and I know Andy will respond, because he knows what I'm about to say, and he hates it when I say it, but I really believe in this. Coordinated, no, because they don't need to. They can just see what's going on. They don't need to have a summit in Yalta or wherever, because the world is so transparent. My greatest fear is that when we look back on the invasion of Ukraine, the second invasion two years ago, the events in southern Israel and Gaza, and what's going on now with the Iranian proxies, that we're going to say, oh, World War III started mm -hmm. and we just didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, good. Well, I don't have any more to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to end on that note. Yes. I, wait, can, and go ahead. A couple of sentences. Your reference to the rules-based order is really important. Since the end of World War II, we have operated. The global economy operates a certain way. That is, there are rules by which we interact. Uh, we wrote those rules. We benefit from those rules. But the one thing we did at the end of that war that is perhaps unprecedented in human history is those rules were to the benefit of others as well. They benefited greatly. Uh, China has had an opportunity and has grown rich, grown wealthy uh, by operating in that order, but it is challenging it in very direct ways. Putin is challenging that in very, in very direct ways. I think it's too easy to sort of look past this and say it's not that important or, or maybe we as a country don't benefit as much as, as we could or should. I think it would be a horrible, horrible mistake for this country to look past just how beneficial that is, not only to us as a people, to sit in this room to have the conversation we're having, but as a country and as a world, for us to turn our backs on that might be one of the biggest failures we could make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our moderator, really to all of you for coming on a Friday night and for these really smart questions.